Welcome to the Grace of Eugene podcast. We exist to help every person in our sphere of influence to encounter Christ, experience biblical community, and extend God's kingdom. You can learn more about us at gracecityeugene.com. Here's the podcast. So we are in week number five of our core strength series. I'd be remiss if I didn't first say, uh, how about Jess Olson last week, huh? Bring in the word. It's, uh, it's always awesome to get to hear uh, what God is doing in and through other folks' hearts in the context of the word and how it is preached. And so I just thought she did a great job. So thanks, Jess, for you and little one bringing us the, the word last week. Well, this week... Uh, we're, we're going to dig into the end of chapter 2, and I'm going to give you just a little bit of a disclaimer here before we get going. It, has anybody read Colossians before? It, it, everyone's like, you're really going to make me raise my hand at church, Pastor? That wasn't to bring shame. It was just seriously curious. Um, the first few chapters, the, if you don't dig in, it can seem kind of repetitive. Um, as you've heard these first four messages the previous weeks, and there will be a little bit of residue in it this week as well. There are a lot of things that just continue to be a part of what Paul is saying. Now, to us in our American worldview where we read things, we're like, okay, I get the point. Can you move on now? It can get kind of annoying. But if we understand why this letter is being written, it's being written to a region, to a church, to warn them about something that is dangerous and going to cause them to stray from what Jesus did on the cross, then like, who are we to be like, come on, Paul, can we just move on? I get it. Like, this was a big deal. And so for me, I'm balancing the tension of like, well, we kind of talked about that already. But if Paul felt that it was a big enough deal that he continued to to talk about the different nuances of it, then who am I to be like, ah, I'm sure we got it. It, let's just move on, right? Like, and so my goal isn't to say the same thing every week, but it's also not to just soar over what is actually being done, what Paul is really trying to make sure that the church in Colossae understands to help them avoid falling susceptible to false teaching. Falling susceptible to false teaching was not just an ancient Near East first century thing. Did you know that false teachers are still out there? And I'm not talking about like the YouTuber blogger that's like the heresy hunter and they're just calling everybody with a big church like a false teacher, okay? I'm talking about people that are trying to teach you dangerous things, trying to pull you away from Jesus being everything to Jesus being part of the equation. That is false teaching. And Paul is coming hard against this stuff. And this week, I believe of what we've talked about so far, I'll just speak for myself This is one of the areas that is the most slippery for me when it comes to falling into false teaching or falling away from Jesus being the profound, all-sufficient sacrifice and Lord and King of my life. This this would be that area. So uh, I'll start out with a question. I guess I'm not starting. I've already said some things. But I'll start my next section with a question. Any crafters in the room? Anybody like to craft? Of course, I know we got crafters because I see y'all's Instagrams, okay? Anybody that likes to build, do like woodworking projects, do kind of DIY projects around the house, got a few of those too. Um, I am not a crafter, but I like to craft with wood and things in all my abundance of spare time. Um, But one of the most satisfying things, I'll speak from a builder DIY standpoint that gets everything 90% done and then moves on. Um, If you want to know what I'm talking about, just come by our house right now. (laughs) My wife's like, hallelujah, he's repenting. Um, (laughs) But there is something about having or catching a vision for something and then using your hands to create it And then realizing that your effort, your skill, your hands, your foresight, your planning creates something that is successful. There's just something special about that, isn't it? Like, man, I 
Whether maybe I saw a Pinterest thing or I was lusting after somebody else's decorations or whatever it may be. You saw something that got a vision into your head and you were able to take your skills or acquire some through hours of YouTube and you were able to put your hands to this thing and most of the time, hopefully, have some sort of success with this. The problem with this very DIY, craft-centric, like, be my own builder, make my own things, be the hero of my own projects mentality, is all too often we put that into our hope game. We try to manufacture, craft, create, build something that we can put our hope in because we've seen it somewhere else, we've glanced at it around the world, and we try to put our own hands to it and build something ourselves that we can have hope in. Now, I'm not knocking the crafting thing, but what I am knocking is when we want to put our hands to creating something that we place our ultimate hope in, that Jesus and the Bible already say, hey, that's already done. That work is done. That work is already done. Now, some of you are like, whew, he didn't get me this morning because I'm not a builder at all. I, that's, that's not my thing. I'm not crafty. But man, I like to flip through Amazon. I like to window shop. And I like to just find things and put things in my house and organize things in a way that give me some hope, comfort, and ease my anxiety. So my hope in bringing that illustration up as well is that I've hit everybody at this point in the time equally. It's that I've hit us all equally. Maybe you're not much of a builder, but you can resonate with seeking out something that you can have your hope in. If I just have this, it will change everything. If I can just save up enough or talk my spouse into letting me acquire this, everything will change. I'll have hope again, right? Like, you ever been there? Is this just a me thing? Maybe it's stuff. Maybe it's your job. If I can just get that promotion, if I can just be recognized for my awesomeness and I can get this next Level, every, I, I can put my hope in that. Maybe it's money. Casey mentioned earlier, those little G-gods like money and success. Maybe it's a relationship. Man, if I could just have a better spouse. If I could just have a spouse, period. If I could just have this in a relationship, I could actually place hope in that thing. I could place my hope in that thing. You see, I spent a significant season of my life believing that there was a God. Like, in the spectrum of my life from a very young age, I have never questioned if there is intelligent design, if there is a God who created everything. But I continuously searched and beta tested anything that would present itself as the thing that would give me hope that I could have my hands on, I could create, cultivate, and manipulate it so that I could have some semblance of control in where I actually found my hope. Can anybody resonate? This is just a Pastor Chris sermon this morning. That's the thing about when we put our hands to something, it's often because we want to have some sort of control in it. We want to be recognized in the outcome for our part in it. And that's why Paul knows that his people, and you know, Jesus' people, the church in Colossae, is so susceptible to this false teaching and because the, is because the human tendency says, I want some control in this. I want to put my hands to. I want to make rules. I want to form things around what is already the all-sufficient supreme work of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And humans want to adapt it and make it something that they can have more control in. But what they're really doing is they're totally diminishing the work of Jesus. And they're sacrificing the power of his work on the cross over sin in their life. They just diminish it. And that is the the framework I want us to read this scripture in today. Is this framework of false hope. How do we manufacture it? How do we seek it? And how does it water down the work of Jesus Christ in our lives? So we're going to read out of Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. And we're going to see what the Lord has for us out of that. Sound good? You can read along on the screens on your own Bible, or you can just listen to me read it. Starting in verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. 
or with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have nothing, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teaching. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual or fleshly indulgence. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. I pray that you would reveal to us your heart through this scripture today. God, I thank you that your word is alive. I pray it would fall upon open ears and open hearts, and that ultimately you wouldn't just help us gain knowledge today, but you would help us take ground for your kingdom and in our relationship with you, that we would be one step closer to you because of what you are going to work in our hearts today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So here, Paul is dealing most directly with the practices of the false teachers that have risen up in Colossae. I kind of told you that at the beginning. But apparently, they are telling Christians that in order to be truly spiritual, they need to obey like a big list of rules. There are all these Jesus and things. Like, yeah, Jesus is great, but you also need to do this, 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 and this. And this teaching was fundamentally opposed to the gospel. And Paul meant to let the Colossians know that. He minces no words. As you read the scripture, it's not like, hey, y'all, like, you know, just be careful. He's like, no, this is trash. <laughs> like, he, he's coming right at it. Paul does not mince words. False teachers in Colossae seem to have been insisting that Christians follow additional practices to be right before God or to have hope rather than recognizing the freedom that we possess in Christ. Paul is saying, like, y'all, you have all you need in Jesus, all this other stuff. Like, stay away from it. This, this isn't what it is packaged up to be. Somebody's putting lipstick and a bow on this thing and trying to sell it to you, and it ain't what it looks like. They were passing judgment on their brothers and sisters on irrelevant questions of, like, food and drink, as you see, and, and festivals and how they celebrated and suggesting that those who didn't follow their practices that were determined by these false teachers were disqualified and possibly not saved. Possibly not saved. Who in here would feel good about someone saying, hey, you didn't take a Sabbath last week? You're not saved. You don't know Jesus. You're not actually following. Like, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem right, does it? Now, we are supposed to rest, and we are supposed to work out of a place of rest in God and what he's given us. But we don't simply lose our salvation because we don't adhere to some paradigm of rules that people and teachers are putting over us here. And he is continuously warning folks against these things. Now, though some of these rules may have seemed like they might have some value, the scripture here says they are a shadow of things to come. Think about that concept of a shadow. A shadow is just kind of like a a dim outline, right? It's like an essence of something. Like, oh, I see a shadow. That means somewhere between that shadow and like there's something that's causing that between the sun and that shadow. And so it directs your attention to something, but the shadow's not the thing, right? I don't see the shadow and be like, wow, what a beautiful tree. Like, it's, it's just an outline, the essence of. It directs you, it can direct your eyes to something or your attention to something else, but it is just a shadow of the reality. And that's what, what Paul's kind of drawn our imagery to here. This is just a faint outline or a hint of what is to come. So yes, our heart direction being towards Jesus should lead us to have some, like, restrictions in our lives, If the Bible tells us to live a certain way, if it says don't get drunk, then you're not going to go out, buy a fifth of whiskey, sit down for a football game, and start chugging. Because the Bible, now that's not being like 
religious, but he's saying they're, they're, that's okay. And that points to some things, but your ability to resist that temptation in the moment is not what saves you. That's not what saves you. Jesus Christ saves you. And people may mess up, but all of these ideas of, well, I want to make good decisions, cool. That's great, but it's just a shadow of what Jesus has done for us. It's just a hint of it. It's just the essence of it. Because the only reason we're able to do that anyway is why? Because of what he's done for and in us. It's just a shadow of the things to come. And these folks were demanding that Christians follow them, and it subtly undermined the substance of the gospel in dangerous ways. It undermined the gospel message. Now, it's helpful because I keep saying the gospel that we define for a working definition. What do I mean when I say the gospel? What do I mean by that? And the, the, at the core of the gospel is this. The kingdom of God has arrived through what Jesus has done in defeating the power of sin and death over the world through his death on the cross and his resurrection three days later. And because of this, we are made right before God by Jesus' blood alone. The cross of Christ is sufficient for our salvation. And any additional religious requirements deny this basic truth of the Christian faith. That is the core of what we have received. When we put our faith in Jesus and when we say, yes, he is my king, he is my Lord and Savior, this is the gospel, the truth, the thing that we have hope in that we declare. Author Douglas Moo puts it this way. He says, for Paul in this case, addition means subtraction. One cannot add to Christ without effect subtracting from his exclusive place in creation and in salvation history. Like you can't add to it without watering down that his work on the cross is all we need. As soon as you start to add layers and add elements to that, you are in essence watering down the work and the completeness of the gospel and the work on the cross. Now, religious people, and when I say that, I mean folks that want to put rules to things, often start out with a good heart. It often, like many things, starts out with a good heart. This desire to please God and this distrust of their fleshly tendencies, so they put their stake in the ground on certain things. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to stay away from this. My life's going to stand for this, right? And they put these rules in place like guardrails to keep you from running off the road. <clears throat> they often start out with a good heart. They create practices that strive to honor him. Yet by making these practices requirements for salvation, they subtly reject the gospel itself. It's okay to have some guidelines in our lives. Like, I love my wife. I honor my marriage. I don't go strolling around town with another female in my car by ourselves. Like, is it because I don't trust myself or my wife doesn't trust me? No. But that's a good guideline that helps honor my marriage. It helps prevent anybody else from making assumptions called, uh, called above reproach, right? Like, that's just, that's just a wise thing to do. But if I don't do that, am I unsaved? Well, not necessarily. It's, it's a good thing, but that is not what is contingent upon my salvation. Like, some of these things come out of wisdom and a good heart, but when they become a requirement for being right with Jesus, it starts to change things, and it starts to reject the potency of Christ's work. Often these folks, as their relationship can be summarized by this. If I just follow these rules, God will love me and then let me into heaven or let me have that fill in the blank that I've always dreamed of. It becomes transactional. If I just do my part, then God is obligated to do his for me. This is not what the gospel looks like. Christianity actually teaches that we are all sinners saved by grace. We are accepted by God thanks to Jesus' sacrifice for us and not because of our performance. It's not something we earn. It's not something that is some transaction that if I give enough of myself, God will be pleased with me and let me into his club. It's not based on that. Gratitude and the realization that Jesus is Lord motivates us to follow his ways. We don't do things to earn our status with him. It's because of our status with him that motivates us to live the way we live. Amen? 
Now, there were four harmful teachings that um, were emphasis of these false teachers in Colossae that I want to highlight today because I believe they are still something that we deal with today. Now, I do my best whenever I'm sharing something with you that's not my words to tell you. This is from a commentary written by a man by the last name of Constable. And he says, these are these four harmful teachings that Paul was addressing, and the essence of them is still present today. And so I just want to share these with you. Hopefully it'll help you, maybe even in your imagination, see how some of these things can tend to slip into our lives, our churches, our relationships, and, uh, and help us to resist these things. The first harmful teaching is this so-called higher knowledge. Anyone experienced uh, any sex of people... Um, Maybe worshiping higher knowledge in our society. They would have called it Gnosticism. Some examples are so-called scientific or archaeological or paleontological facts that contradict Scripture. So-called revelations that claim to be on par with Scripture and teaching that directly contradicts biblical revelation. So putting this ascension to a certain place of knowledge and intellect of the things of the world above what Scripture says, what God's Word says, what He says is true. This so-called teaching that higher knowledge or reaching some higher level of knowledge actually adds to your resume of following Jesus or what level of salvation you have achieved. The second harmful teaching is the observance of laws in order to win God's favor. I'm not talking about like, you know, the laws that we pass in elections or they're in, you know, traffic laws. I'm talking about legalism. Legalism. Some examples are salvation by works. That if you don't serve this way, if you don't do this, if you don't give this, if you don't do this, then you're not actually in good graces with Jesus. That is salvation by works. It's legalism. Teaching that puts Christians under the Mosaic law, being Old Testament law. Teaching that says sanctification comes by keeping man-made rules, not by following the way of Jesus. Now, this can be a little bit of a sticky tension sometimes in church because like, if you've been around here for a bit, you realize that we have a high value on discipleship. And what we mean by discipleship is the intentional relationship that helps others find and follow Jesus in a more and more meaningful way every day, right? We're always helping each other take a step towards Jesus. Now, if I'm talking to another Christian and they're asking me to help disciple them, help them understand what it looks like to follow Jesus in a more meaningful way, there's going to be conversations where I say, hey, bro, like this thing you're doing probably isn't honoring God, and we should talk about what it looks like to pivot on that, to, to not do that, right? Like, that's discipleship. And in the church, there is a context for accountability and discipleship and helping people understand how to better honor and follow Jesus. But those things aren't what you, how you earn your salvation, right? And you don't lose your salvation because you're not obeying your disciple, whoever's discipling you's rules enough. So we need to recognize that, like, praise God, we are in a time and a place where discipleship is alive and well. And we want to help each other follow Jesus in a more meaningful, better way. But those things are not contingencies upon which Jesus gives us favor, adopts us into sonship or daughtership, or saves us. Those are just part of the journey of sanctification, being more and more like him. And so I find that it's important to understand the difference from that. If Quinn comes up to me and says, hey, I see that this has been a part of what your life is looking like lately. Here's what the Bible says. Can I walk with you as we overcome that temptation or that sin in your life? I'm not going to say, oh, false teacher, (laughs) right? Like, he's just trying to help me love Jesus better. And he's not saying, hey, dude, you're not saved anymore and you can't preach anymore because you had a bad day. He's saying, hey, I love you. Can we engage relationally together to follow Jesus in a better, more meaningful way? Do we get that difference? The third harmful teaching is the belief that beings other than Christ must mediate between people and God. It's mysticism. Now, oftentimes, especially if you've grown up in the church or you've been around church community for a long time, it it can seem like mysticism is this far off distant thing that just happens in like the hills of Appalachia or something. And that's just, that's not the case. When we planted this church, 
Our Lane County was third in the nation per capita for witchcraft, occult, voodoo, like practicing those things. That is a form of mysticism. Other beings going to other mediums to like mediate and give you power and give you direction. <clears throat> this is a false teaching. You don't have to go to angels to be able to have communion with Jesus. That was one of the things that these false teachers were teaching in Colossae. Like, Going to a different intermediary to have access to Jesus, like that is just not in the Bible. Jesus bridges the gap between us and God, not some other intermediary. If that stuff is popping up, you're stepping or hearing or receiving some teaching that is new age, it's not biblical, it's not okay, talk to someone to help you out with that, okay? That is not good. Similarly, there's examples that people teach that your experiences are what actually help you get like saved as well. And so that's I talked about the tension of discipleship in a church that recognizes that the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still alive and well today, and we practice them, and we ask for, we eagerly desire for the power and presence of God to come in our community. None of the things that God may give you as gifts are prerequisites for your salvation. They are just an enhancement of it. So you can do the work of the church to reach people, to see the kingdom of God expanded. When you receive spiritual gifts, if you get the gift of prophecy or you're praying in tongues or whatever it may be, that is so that you go from using hand tools to power tools now, right? Like it's just a different set of tools in your tool belt. It doesn't mean now I'm finally saved. That is false teaching that tells you you have to have these things to be made right before God. It's an, it's an enhancement, not a prerequisite. Amen? The fourth harmful teaching is the practice of abstaining from things in order to earn merit with God. Um, this is pronounced a couple different ways that I've heard. I just say asceticism. Um, some commentaries say it differently. But there's a lot of vowels, so it's almost like you're in Hawaii. Um, but anyway, that's what it is called. Some examples of this are, face, are fasting to force God's hand. Like, have you ever heard of people like, I'm going to fast and I'm going to make God show up in this? It's like, bro, you need to read your Bible. Like, it doesn't work that way. But this whole idea of living in isolation to avoid temptation, fasting to force God's hand, functionally holding him hostage like a kid that's not going to eat until the parent gives them mac and cheese, right? We've all had that situation. Fingers are being pointed on the other side of the room. <clears throat> this idea that I'm going to have a power struggle with God so I get my way. How childish of a way to relate with the creator of the universe. But this was one of the things that was being Taught self-mutilation so that you could prove that my body means nothing to me. Ultimately, I just want to escape the prison of the flesh and be in the spiritual realm. Like these are the things that these people were being taught and being told. And Paul's like, nah, fam, this isn't it. Like this is a cheap, cheap interpretation of what Jesus actually offers. So those are kind of four of the things that I think as you hear me talk about them, Hopefully at least a couple of them you see how, yeah, I've, I've seen that taken some, I've seen that around here. And we need to avoid it. We need to identify it and call it out when we do see it so that the family, the flock is protected. Amen. Amen. Often religious rules um, can seem like they're glorifying to God. I think we, we could agree to that. Like some of these things I talked about earlier. Yet sometimes trying to create a 10-foot pole around sin that we can just kind of, oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting too close. I, I see the, the guardrail. I see that I'm getting close. I just need to stay so far away from it is more dangerous than actually trusting the Holy Spirit being God in you, his wisdom and discernment working through you to be at work in you in these moments. So what I'm saying is sometimes trying to put your own rules and regulations around everything is more dangerous than just trusting that God is in you and he's going to point things out and you actually get the opportunity to respond from a heart that's being transformed and redeemed. You see, when we question if God is in us, if he's speaking to us, and if we have the power to actually listen and obey, then we put all these little like minefields around things to keep us from getting too close, to scare us away, right? Whether it's some, uh, like some watch software on your computer or whatever it is, like, oh, I would never go look at that thing because so-and-so will know, right? Like there's all of these things we put as minefields to scare us away instead of trusting that God's going to work in me. 
He's redeemed me. He's changing my heart. He's taking a heart of stone and making a heart of flesh. He is causing me to be tender towards the things that he cares about. And he'll tell me if I'm getting off track. But we're so scared that we won't respond right that we try to put all these other things, like protective mechanisms around it. Some Christians, out of fear of drunkenness, just refuse to even look at alcohol. And now for some people, if you've dealt with addiction or you have in your family and all that, I'm not knocking that. But if your heart is, I'm so scared of that that I'm not going to have anything to do with it, like maybe there's something deeper that we need to look at. For others, from a fear of sexual immorality, we actually start issuing blanket restrictions against dancing. (laughs) Apparently, we don't have many people that grew up that way. There are people that believe we don't dance because it's a, just a vertical expression of a horizontal action. And we stay away from that because that is not good. And we should not dance because that gets too close to being bad. Like, these are the kind of things that happen. The kind of, <laughs> that was a good one, wasn't it? And now, though these, these statements, they, they have an appearance of wisdom, and they may be wise at a particular time for particular people. Please don't hear me say, when Pastor Chris says, everybody should always drink alcohol. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Well, what's the heart behind why you're abstaining, why you're staying away from things? But these can be dangerous as universal rules, as just something you say, everybody has to go by this because this is what, how I see it. We're kind of stepping in some dangerous territory. It's in dangerous te- territory. And we're creating unnecessary rules that can lead us into error in three ways. The first is this. We may begin to judge people and accuse them of sin for not following the rules we've created rather than using wise judgment to correct true sin. You ever met someone that's told you, like, you shouldn't do that? And you say, why? Well, because I found that for me, <laughs> I can't do that. Or my mama told me that I shouldn't do that. Or, or uh, my pastor said you shouldn't do that. That's awesome. Can you show me like, where, where this is in the scripture? Because I really, I want to be able to pray scripture over this thing if it's going to be a struggle for me, right? Like you, you respond that way. Like, no, that's, just, that's what mama said I, I need to do, right? Like, and it's things that rules that people have created that they expect you to just take For yourself, rather than use wise judgment, have tact and maturation in Christ that dictate your steps and your ways. Now, here's what I'm not saying, family. I'm not saying that things that are clearly sinful, not good, and will cause others to stumble, you just say, nah, God's given me liberty to just go ahead and discern what to do here. And how dare you tell me that I shouldn't do that? And then the person says, well, actually, did you know that I was an alcoholic for 10 years? And when I'm around you and you do that, it is really hard for me to continue to honor God and his work in my life when you do that. And you forget about the scripture that says you shouldn't make another brother or sister stumble. Like, just because of your own Christian liberty and grace, that's where that starts to go sideways. So don't just take and cherry pick certain scriptures that help your case. Take the entire context of the word of God and his heart and what is he is trying to accomplish here on earth rather than just what's convenient for your behavior in any given moment. Another way that this can be dangerous is we may seem like we're avoiding sin to others, but we avoid actually dealing with the sin in our hearts. Because if we just make it all about our behavior and trying to look like we don't have any issues, but then we go home and we sin in private, we actually remove ourselves from one of the very mechanisms that God gives us to help be sanctified, and that is community and discipleship and the body of Christ. And when you just sin in private, you remove yourself from the very covering of the church, the bride of Christ. In our attempt to stifle our flesh out of this religious, just rule following, putting off a good presentation, we actually indulge in our sin in private and fuel our pride. And pride just wells up within us and it starts to deteriorate our hearts and our souls and our relationships. The third reason this is dangerous is we may place our security in our adherence to rules rather than in Jesus. We find ourselves 
waving like a reed in the wind because any time that you come up short, you think that you're insecure and you're not saved and Jesus is going to be mad at you because he's super insecure like that. And we forget that our security is rooted in the work on the cross, our acceptance of that, not our ability to modify our behavior on any given day. Our security is in the work on the cross, our accepting that for us, not on our ability to follow rules. This false teaching is this toxic blend of religion, which is do X and you'll be accepted, and irreligion, which is don't believe the gospel, just do whatever you'd like. The gospel is grace. Jesus died to accept you, and truth that we get to repent and follow and believe in the gospel. It's grace and truth, not religion or irreligion. Jesus died to accept you. Repent and believe the gospel and that it's good news for you and you have the opportunity to declare that it's good news for everyone else that God may give you a conversation with. Verse 18 lets us know that false teachers weren't just good religious Jews as some academics have insisted. They were selectively irreligious, pretending to be super spiritual in like kind of a pagan kind of of way. They were worshiping angels, pretending that they received special visions and acting like philosophical know-it-alls. And they probably sounded smart and sounded charismatic and believable, which false teachers usually do, spoiler alert. But in this way, they were rather irreligious. And this is a lesson for us. Because there's many people that insist they know the truth. They have the market on truth. They have found this fresh new revelation and nobody else is strong enough in the spiritual to have heard it like they have. And they stand there and they'll tell you like, I know what is true. And some of these people sound religious and others sound more worldly like intellectual or spiritualist. But all false Teaching is a blend of these things, and it's all dangerous. It's this blend of being super religious when it's convenient and very irreligious when that's convenient, and blending it and waving like the wind between the two, depending on whatever you are confronting in any given moment. This can make it hard to sniff out because you're like, man, this doesn't seem like a religious spirit right now. Like, they seem very free, right? And then the next moment, they're super religious. It just looks different. It's just packaged different. And so it can be hard to kind of identify, and that's why we need to recognize there is a tension there. It is both religious and irreligious. Now, what's the antidote for false teaching? According to Paul, the answer is to hold on to Christ in verse 19, to stay connected to Christ. The fundamental problem with the competing teacher of the Colossians is that they have not maintained contact with Christ. They thought they knew all they needed to know about Jesus, and they went on their own little spiritual journey and wanted to collect all these other ways and means to connect with the spiritual realm and have all these other rules so that they could build up their spiritual resume and develop a following so that they could have a platform for us social media influencers in the room. That's funny because I'm not at all. <clears throat> when we let go of Jesus. The daily walking in our identity is those who've been saved by him and are satisfied in him. Then we will start to look for those things in other places. And people in our society often, having seen the foolishness of such rules or religiousness, thanks to their personal experience, and I bet all of us in here could relate to having some personal experience, seeing how just being a super rule follower is not attractive and actually leads to what we would call hypocrisy at times. <clears throat> we, they, then these people decide that there are no rules worth following besides the ones they've deemed worthy, the ones that work for me. Because you look around and you're like, this rule thing it looks really hypocritical and you're saying this but doing this. And so now we start to develop, develop this idea of our own truth, which is really popular right now. Because the fruit of what we've been told is spiritual or Christian or religious looks rotten. <laughs> and so we start to find a way to grow our own new fruit that we dictate what is valuable and we decide how we're going to preserve that because we can't trust the fruit that we're seeing out there. That's what can lead to this stuff breaking down. 
Now pretend for a moment that, that you live this way. You're wary of the poor religious rules of others and you've gone shopping down the aisle of spirituality and you've kind of put together this religion all on your own. You've taken from what I say, this is the spiritual buffet, right? You're like, I like that one. Ooh, that's got some tasty ingredients. Let's bring that over here. And I like that part of that religious expression. And all of a sudden you've just got this like cobbled together conglomerate of a bunch of like religious pieces that actually conflict with one another, but they seem attractive to you on certain days. So you pile them in. You say, actually, this is what I believe. This is my truth. Imagine, imagine you're living that way, right? You believe in God, but you've got your own views about him. We all know those folks. Jesus is a good guy, and you're, you're pretty sure most people end up in heaven, because I read Rob Bell, and you're spiritual, but in a make-it-up-as-you-go kind of way. And maybe you're following a certain teacher or philosophy or a certain religious leader, but in any case, you're certainly not a church-going legalist, right? Whew. You're not one of those people. One of those church-going legalists that go, and they even go to church early and set up chairs and all this stuff, right? You're not one of those people. But of course, you do live in a certain way with certain rules. You're especially concerned about certain matters of justice and gender and economics. And you're not going to associate with those backwards people that disagree with you. None of this happens in our country around elections. Well, now, if this is you, you kind of seem legalistic too, right? Like, you were trying to be all, like, hands off, like, I'm just super irreligious. I'm not holding people to all those poor religious rules. But now, you have things that you will actually disassociate relationally because of these rules and these standards in your own life. So, um, you seem kind of legalistic too, it's pretty hard and fast rules of behavior that you've developed around you. And you view yourself as righteous, not because you trust in Jesus, but because you followed the rules that you deem valuable. There is a tension here of religious and irreligious that I hope this highlights for you. Because this example is way too large a percentage of the communities we live in. These ideologies, these ways of thinking about things are far too prevalent. And family, God wants to get your paradigm right so that you can be a part of redeeming these false ideologies and helping people have hope in the one true thing that is worthy, and that is the work of Jesus Christ. The hope of the gospel, the fact that he redeems, he saves, he transforms our heart. Not in your ability to define your own truth, create your own fruit, and manufacture hope. He doesn't want you to have false hope. He wants you to have hope in the one thing that will never let you down. That will never let you down. Worship team, you can come back up. <clears throat> because if you live life this way, cherry picking in any given moment what you feel or what spiritually works for you or what your truth is, you'll soon find you failed to adhere to the very rules you've placed on yourself. And then you'll just rewrite them because nobody likes to fail, right? Oh, I got to write new rules now. And now I got to reorient my whole, like, I got to go back to the spiritual buffet and I got to find a bunch more things to orient my life around and rationalize the way I live and my truth and find another thing that might give me good fruit, which is another way of saying, find another thing that I can place my hope in. And if we continue to chase our tail trying to dictate where we can find hope, trying to create our own hope, we are going to end up empty shells of humans that are void of relationship, meaning, and purpose. And that is why we need to recognize the work on the cross is sufficient. It's supreme. It's done everything we need it to. And we just need to respond to it and live in a way that says, hey, I'm going to be really bad at this sometimes but I'm going to devote my life to whatever I have in me, giving it to Christ, giving it to what he's done for me. I can't live up to all the expectations, all the standards the Bible says, but because of Christ in me, because of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit living in me and empowering me, I can actually walk down that road and see what God might do. False hope leaves you empty. Hope in the gospel leaves you full. In fact, it leaves you overflowing into those around you. And it becomes so much more or, than just being about you finding hope for you. Because the cool thing about this real hope in the gospel that we're talking about is then that you become an ambassador for that hope for others. And whether you're introvert 
or you're just like in a bad season right now and you'd rather not deal with people, or you're an extrovert. Like, I believe all of us ultimately want to leave a legacy and an impact for better wherever God would use us. And we desire to hear stories of, man, God did something in me, and it was meaningful to that person when they heard about it, and it led to their life pursuing Jesus and changing, to meaningful change, like not so that we can get any glory, but so that we can recognize that Christ in us points others to him, because that's what true hope does. False hope says, watch me while I figure this out. True hope says, look at Christ in me, and he can be there for you too. And that is what Paul is trying to make sure the church in Colossae sticks to. This isn't about us finding our own way, creating our own spirituality. This is about us pointing to the God who saves and gave his son for us. Amen. God, I thank you so much for the work done on the cross. I thank you that Jesus' work was so complete in conquering sin, Satan, and death that we don't have to try to figure out how to add to it. We don't have to try to figure out how to maneuver it so that it works for us. God, it already does, and you gave us hope in the gospel so that we can bring and shine hope into the world. And so I pray just against any false idols of security, false identities, anything that would lead us to thinking we need to manufacture something to have hope in in our lives, and that God, by the power of your spirit, you would direct us to the truth of the gospel and the work on the cross for our hope and a hope for this world. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship. Hey, thanks for checking out our YouTube video today. We appreciate you taking the time to tune in with us. Before you take off, please hit the like button. And if you want more of this content and you want to be notified when we put out new videos, hit the subscribe button and the little bell for notifications right next to it. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.